Yeah, just let me know when you're ready. Yeah, yeah, we'll fill it. Okay, yeah, let's begin. What's, uh, what's that for? Have you ever wanted to punish someone? No, uh, I don't know what that means. What you mean? Of course you don't. It's cracking, guys. Omar Isaf here, back with another video. This is a long interview that is well worth your time. No fluff. 45 minutes with PhD, so let's say Dr. Eric Trexler, PhD, the co-host of the Stronger by Science podcast, talking about his PhD thesis, metabolic adaptation, so optimizing body composition for individuals that want to lose fat but also retain muscle, nutritional strategies. Again, in 2020, I want to bring top level content, so I'm very thankful for Eric for appearing on this channel. This gets into the nitty gritty details, everything you need to know in order to optimize your body composition. If you enjoy these in-depth videos, help us out. Give this a rating, so a like on YouTube, share it around, and also make sure to check out Eric Trexler. A link to all his social media is in the description. So let's get right into it. Metabolic adaptation, what is it, and how can we optimize our body composition when trying to lose weight? Wow, is all I can say. I am joined by the legendary Eric Trexler. For those that are probably already familiar, we have, I wouldn't call it a small podcast. Let's be honest, it's quite popular. Iron Culture, the podcast. He's my co-host and co-founder. Uh, Eric, why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, yeah, I'm, my name's Eric. I have a PhD. I'm a natural pro bodybuilder. Yeah. To my knowledge, I'm the only person that checks off all three of those boxes. Yeah. Uh, the last year, I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the Iron Culture podcast, which has been a wild ride. Yeah. And, you know, just started 2020, and we've got a lot in store. So I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, I... It's it's weird, man. When I think about what we've accomplished already with Iron Culture in 2019, there's no one else I rather would have gone on this journey with. So I just thank you for really taking the culture to the next level and doing every single episode with me, man. It's been fantastic having you on board. I pre I mean, it's been fun. I, I've enjoyed it. Um, it. It's all about teamwork, and you've been great. And and that is why today we're actually talking about your PhD, which is entirely relevant for the population watching this channel. I'd say anyone that's interesting interested in optimizing their body composition, for those that kind of want the short summary, because we have those fitness bros, Eric, they're like, you know what, man, I don't want to watch a 40 minute video. Okay. I like I care about my physique, but I don't really care about my physique. Just give me the too long didn't read. Can you just quickly and then we're going to rewind it back and really get into the nuts and bolts. And for those that want to learn and enable themselves to achieve their best physique, that's for you. For the individuals that want the quick summary, can you define what metabolic adaptation is and the practical implications of it? Yeah. So when we lose weight, we become a smaller person. We have less biologically active tissue. And because of that, we would expect that our energy expenditure will go down, go down to some extent. There is less living tissue to use energy. Metabolic adaptation explains the fact that when we do lose weight, our total energy expenditure actually drops more than it should based on that loss of mass alone. So it's this adaptive response to weight loss that, uh, you know, the, the practical implication of that is as we lose weight, you know, we do so by creating an energy deficit. But as we start to have this adaptive reduction in energy expenditure, it makes the deficit smaller than it otherwise should be, which ultimately slows the weight loss process and um, makes our path a little bit more challenging. Yeah. And I would say this basically explained when I first read your article, it's fantastic on strongerbyscience.com. I'll link it. It explained why my fat loss had stalled. You know, I thought to myself that it was the two large pizzas I was eating every Saturday. But when I heard metabolic adaptation, I knew, Eric, that I had found the magic bullet. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, metabolic adaptation, you asked, you know, what are the, the practical implications? Yep. It is something that we should be aware of. It's something that we should plan for and have a strategy or solution for in, in terms of dealing with it. But it is not quite as dire as some people uh, seem to believe. So a lot of people think that it is this, you'll hear, hear the term starvation mode. And, you know, people think, once I get to a certain level in this diet, there, I'm out of solutions and I will stop losing fat no matter what I do. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, uh, you know, a small but practically meaningful reduction in energy expenditure, which makes us dig a little bit deeper when it comes to how we wish to deal with that. If, if we expect that we're just going to do one drop in calories and ride that out until we're totally shredded, it's probably not going to work that way. We're probably going to have to really plan for this down the road. 
And it must be pretty damn frustrating, like you said, for yourself, you're a natural pro bodybuilder, when there's an emotional attachment to how we look, and we think we're eating the amount of calories that we need in order to lose weight, and hearing that we need to dig a little bit deeper, you start questioning to yourself, because if you use a formula, and you think, okay, I'm getting leaner, I'm getting leaner, and I should be losing weight at this level, but I'm not, I just, I can only assume, I've, I've only ever gotten down to 31% body fat, it's the lowest I've ever gotten to, but I can only assume, Eric, that it's frustrating. Uh, it is. Yeah. And I mean, the thing that's funny about it is once you know about it and you know the generally how much to expect and what you can do about it, it becomes way less frustrating. It, yeah. it kind of just becomes part of life. So uh, the first time I did a, a contest prep, it was extremely frustrating, mostly because it was confusing. Um, but but the other times I've prepped since learning more about it, it's just something you plan for. I mean, it's uh, it's an inconvenience, but it's it's not as frustrating when you understand what's happening. It, the, the confusion is the part when you're really not certain if you're going to find a solution. That That's what gets really frustrating. But uh, but yeah, it's something to plan for. It's something that we can certainly get through as a dieter, but it does require you to dig a little bit deeper when you're already digging deep, which is, which is no easy task. Yeah, and, and that's why there's a story I haven't really shared, Eric. Uh, before publicly, but I, I don't know if you've heard of this individual, Eric Helms. Um, he's someone that, yeah, okay, yeah, not not very well known, but he's an individual that competes in bodybuilding. I He says he has a PhD, but I witnessed him at the end of contest prep the night before a show hold someone a knife point because they didn't bring him his seaweed salad, a server, and um, he, he used very strong language to say the least. There, there's a recording, it almost went on World Star. But we, we managed to take it down before it really blew up. But I, I've seen, the point is, is that I've seen firsthand, Eric, what happens when things get out of control. So I'm just really thankful that you're on the channel here, breaking everything down. And I think anyone that endeavors to get lean at some point, and I, I do think even if you're a strength athlete, even if you're an individual where you don't, let's say, identify as a bodybuilder, there is at some point in time where you want to optimize your body composition, you want to lose fat, you want to retain your muscle mass, and some of these things will likely become relevant. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it, it does depend on your circumstances. So going from, you know, just using the BMI categories, going from obese to overweight, if it's a small weight reduction and you're not getting super shredded, then, then this is less prevalent of an issue. But the larger the overall total of weight loss or the leaner you get at the end, that's where we really start to see some of the bigger cases of metabolic adaptation. So if you set out to lose 80 pounds, 100 pounds, or if you're trying to get to, you know, five, six percent body fat, that's where we see the most glaring cases. It, to some extent, you know, it, it factors in elsewhere. But those are the times where we, we really have to, to put together a plan and, and kind of account for it. Yeah. So now that we answer the fitness bros and they feel it's like, you know what? I got my answer. I'm gone. Everyone that wants to get now into the nitty gritty and truly understand metabolic adaptation and how to potentially deal with it. Let's just first define some very basic concepts. Eric, can you talk about what a metabolism is and what is BMR? Yeah. So when we talk about metabolism in the fitness industry approach to it, we're, we're usually talking about metabolic rate. We're not talking about like nitty gritty cytochrome p450 enzymes in the liver right? right it's not like drug metabolism so we we burn a certain amount of calories in a given day um, from the combination of everything we do so that's our total daily energy expenditure um, when i think of metabolism globally that's what i'm mostly thinking of but we can break that down into uh kind of sub components of that so we've got our basal metabolic rate or our resting metabolic rate and that is basically um I assume most days you probably don't get out of bed, just kind of lay around, don't do much. Yeah. So if we were to measure the amount of energy you spend just laying in bed, not eating, not moving, that's your basal metabolic rate. Yeah. Um, a lot of labs use resting metabolic rate mm -hmm. uh, because basal metabolic rate, to, to truly call it that, you have to actually have the, the participant sleep over in the lab and then start measuring it w when they wake up. Yeah. Um, usually we'll, we'll be like, hey, why don't you drive into the lab? Just don't eat anything before have them rest for a little while and then measure it. So they're synonymous, but they're not exactly the same. But it's basically the energy that you're expending at, at rest just to keep your body viable and living. Then there's the thermic effect of feeding. So when we, when we eat food, there's some increase in uh, energy expenditure in response to eating. 
basically involved with uh, digesting, metabolizing what we eat and an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity immediately after consuming that food. So there's the thermic effect of feeding. Then we've got uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT, as a lot of people call it. That is the energy that we spend during day-to-day -day activities that are not specific structured exercise. So, um, you know, walking down down the street to get your mail or whatever, walking out to get the garbage can and bring it back to, to the driveway, whatever. That's non-exercise, but it is activity. So that's non-activity thermogenesis. And then finally, there's exercise activity thermogenesis, which is, I assume you do um, some type of exercise, Omar. Pilates, yeah. For individuals, you told me off uh, camera, Eric, that you actually have, in fact, measured many people's, would it be BMR or overall uh, trying to figure out how many calories that they need to eat on a daily basis in order to remain in homeostasis? I've, I've measured a lot of resting metabolic rates. Right. So in the morning, fasted, yeah. in a resting state, but but not, you know, sleeping over at the lab and all that. But yeah, I, I've measured many, many resting metabolic rates d during my time as a, a researcher. And one of the things that you remarked was just that uh, some people are surprised at how low their resting metabolic rate is once they find it out. Well, it's I, I think a lot of people come in with an idea that they either have a really fast metabolism or a really extraordinarily slow metabolism. In most cases, yeah. it, it usually just scales with body size pretty well. Yeah. Uh, people that, that weigh more tend to have uh, higher. People that weigh very little tend to have lower and I, I see both sides of it. I see people who are very lean naturally and they're like, oh, my resting metabolic rate is going to be through the roof. And we measure it. It's pretty normal. And then we see people who are like, oh, my metabolism is so slow. Every time I try to lose weight, it, it fails. I, I'm probably going to have a super low metabolic rate. And we measure it. And then, again, it's it's usually pretty normal. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Now, what uh, quickly to go off on a tangent, what would you say are some of the discrepancies then between their uh, perceived uh, metabolism and then you know what actually is when they'll say things so you'll have individuals they'll say once again well I have a sluggish man. I I can't I can't lose weight man like you know I so I have a friend they could eat a certain amount I eat that I can't lose weight and then they find out maybe in reality what their uh, BMR is what what are probably what's going on there Man, there's a lot of answers to that question. So I, my brain doesn't work well enough to organize them. There, there's so many things that can be at play. So a really obvious one is a lot of times people underestimate their food intake uh, and they overestimate their activity level. So a lot of times there's there's just uh, their perception of how much they exercise or how much activity they have and their perception of caloric intake are both a little bit off. So what they perceive as their situation looks different from their more objective assessment of what other people do. Hmm. Another thing to keep in mind is that some people, when they overfeed, and we have we have uh, multiple lab studies showing this, some people, when you purposely overfeed them, their energy expenditure goes up uh, kind of as an adaptive response to that. Mm -hmm. So there is a real thing where, yeah, there are probably some people who have a, you know, you and your friend might have both have pretty normal resting metabolic rates. But their metabolic response to overfeeding could be very different from yours. And so they might be very resistant to weight gain. And so you look at them and you're like, God, they, their resting metabolic rate must be through the roof because I see them eat all this stuff all the time and they don't get fatter. Um, but, but there's other components of metabolic rate that are a lot more informative um, than the resting metabolic rate. So that's usually the, the big discrepancy. And non-exercise activity is highly variable. So... I mean, there, there's studies saying that two people, same biological sex, same body size, uh, just by differences in how they spend their day, their non-exercise activity thermogenesis could differ by up to 2,000 calories on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So 2,000 calories goes a long way, Omar. Yeah. Uh, so so those are the, the big things. Think, think of how many pizzas, once again, you can eat. I, I just, you know, I, I think to myself that there's two points. I've actually heard you uh, say this before that one, individuals grossly also overestimate how many calories they burn in the gym. So when you do uh, physical activity, where it's like, oh man, you know, I, I crushed that squat workout. Like I must have burned 800 calories or some of those heart rate monitors. And then actually when you measure it, you know, uh, these are just rough numbers, but it's like 150, 200 calories. And then the second thing actually, uh, just your uh, commentary on this would be how individuals say, you know, I'm, I'm relatively lean or I have, a, I have a lot of muscle. Muscle is very metabolically active. I'm just, I'm an inferno. And so they, they have this, they have two assumptions that one, 
because they built some muscle, I could eat X amount of calories because I crushed it in the gym. I could eat even more. And it's kind of this narrative. Yeah, definitely. And, and there's been, um, increased focus on that idea that if, if you put on a little bit of muscle tissue, that you're going to have a huge increase in your resting metabolic rate. The, the, the actual measurements are, are very underwhelming, very disappointing. If, if that was, if you were banking on putting on some muscle to afford yourself a, a drastically different daily intake, yeah. um, it, it just doesn't seem to work. I mean, it, it increases to some extent, typically your, your resting energy expenditure, but it's not nearly as much as, as you would hope or think. Yeah, you're not talking about anyone in particular. You're just saying very generally, Eric, if one was to feel those things. Correct. Yeah. Right. I mean, it'd be great. I, I, I'd love it, but yeah, I, it just doesn't seem to pan out. Now, let's talk about something a little controversial. Let's talk about hormones. Uh, the role of hormones. So we have individuals now where they think to themselves, okay, you know, whatever. That might be my uh, BMR. I'm looking at some point in time to lose weight. What happens with hormones? Like, what are the role of hormones when it comes to weight loss? Yeah, so we do have a lot of hormones that fluctuate uh, in response to weight loss. So there's really two components of weight loss um, that are necessary requirements. So part one is you introduce an energy deficit. You are burning more calories day to day than you're consuming. So there's the acute uh, state of being in an energy deficit. And there are several hormones that are responsive to that. There's also hormones that are responsive to the gradual reduction in fat mass. Okay, so usually in a weight loss diet, you can try to parse out which which one is doing which, but they're, they're both going to be there. We're going to be in a deficit and losing fat mass. And so th some of the key hormones that we see changing during this process, um, I would say uh, this is not controversial. The most important one is going to be leptin. Okay, so leptin is going to change and that's going to really, if, if you're going to blame metabolic adaptation on one thing, leptin would be where where you're going to focus that blame. So leptin is going to go down when we're in an energy deficit. It's also going to go down when we lose fat mass. So leptin is a really key hormone, but we see other hormones change as well. So we'll see ghrelin typically go up and ghrelin is a, a hunger related hormone. When ghrelin's really high, you know, we perceive hunger. Um, insulin tends to go down throughout this process. Thyroid hormone goes down. Uh, the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone tend to go down. And then cortisol in some cases goes up. Not always, but it, it really depends on exactly what that weight loss effort looks like. Um, but, but in any case, we do have this um, a number of, of really critical hormones that are altered by, by weight loss attempts. Sure. And then with the magnitude of how much you're trying to lose weight. So let's let's take first someone that has a higher body fat percentage and then the rate of weight loss. What are the influence of those two? So your starting body fat level and then the rate of weight loss on these hormones and overall on the process. Yeah, so certainly um, they both matter. Um, you know, if, if you're a person who's starting this weight loss attempt uh, in, in an obese state, and I, I don't use that with like all the judgmental baggage that comes with the term obese, but I'm just talking clinically here. Yeah. If you're starting in an obese state, a lot of these hormonal shifts are going to be neutral to positive. Okay. Yeah. So what we'll see is sometimes uh, obese males, uh, as they go from obese to normal weight, they'll actually improve their hormonal milieu in, in terms of their testosterone levels and everything else. We also see that the, the changes in leptin going from obese to normal weight aren't that critical because a lot of times obese individuals have high leptin, but they're leptin resistant. So their receptors are no longer sensitive to the leptin in their system. So in that, can, in that state, we're not as worried about these hormonal uh, fluctuations. But when we go from normal weight to very, very lean, uh, that's where we start to see the biggest changes in these hormones. When you see somebody who's in the, like a contest prep state, I've been, you know, in, in contest prep and, you know, I was like eight weeks out, still had plenty of fat to lose. And my testosterone, the normal reference range is like 300 to 1100 units. Mine was like 141 and plummeting. So I don't even know how low it got. But at that point, who cares? You just don't have it anymore. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, when, when you start getting really shredded, that's when this stuff really gets big. And, and as you as you alluded to it, it's it's quite likely that some of these hormones, because they're sensitive to energy deficits in general, it's pretty likely that really extreme deficits are probably going to move that needle in, in a little bit more of an exaggerated manner. So generally speaking, if you're interested in trying to manage some of these changes in hormones, I think the safest bet is to try to manage the deficit relatively carefully and not make it any larger than it must be in order to keep a reasonable rate of weight loss. 
Um, when it comes to the other side of, of I mean, if you want to get shredded, you're going to be shredded. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there's not much you can do about that part. So, you know, the reason that we often say, hey, keep an eye on the rate of weight loss, try to kind of try to manage it, keep it in a kind of moderate range rather than being a really severe rate is the idea that we can't really, we can't really influence that endpoint much, but we can at least try to, we can at least try to manipulate and alter the rate of weight loss to minimize how severe that deficit is. So if we had a, uh, try and define what a reasonable rate of weight loss is then Eric for individuals out there, what would that be? I know it depends upon a person and we tend to define it as a percentage of total weight loss per week. Yeah, yeah. And so usually what I'll set as my my typical guideline is somewhere between half a percent to one percent of body mass per week. That's a pretty typical uh, rate of weight loss that most people will say if you're in there, you're probably going to minimize the, the, the real place where we get that number in most in instances is trying to uh, minimize reductions in performance and reductions in lean body mass. So that that's typically where a lot of people are getting that number from. I do suspect that some of those hormonal factors play a role in the study showing that that rate of weight loss tends to be fairly successful with maintaining performance and, and body composition in the, the place we'd like it. Once you start getting to really rapid weight loss, uh, in many cases, you know, population level, some people, you know, are, are, are they respond quite well to rapid weight loss um, or, or better than others, I guess. But generally speaking, really rapid weight loss, we're going to, it's going to be more likely that we see some pretty pronounced decrements in performance in the gym and also uh, a higher proportion of weight lost as lean tissue rather than fat tissue. Yeah. You know, my goal is just to lose as much muscle mass as possible. Um, try and retain that body fat that I need when once again, the apocalypse happens and just be, uh, probably the most efficient, eunuch out there because i want i want to get not shredded in terms of a low body fat percent just in terms of actual weight um but still a high body a high body fat percentage but a low weight if you dig what i'm saying and with just a complete uh, the the hormonal profile uh would can only be described as disgusting yeah and i mean to your credit i think you've been doing a terrific job with that i've been talking to helms and he's been yeah. remarking uh, about your changes in body composition and uh, from what he's telling me, it sounds like you're you're very much doing that. Yeah, he's told me to stop several times just contacting him, but I just take that as him being you know hard to get. So we we have a, we have a unique relationship. But um, I, I do want you to walk us through what you said. A lot of these things tend to occur uh, as you get leaner and leaner. But let's walk through maybe an example of an individual and what happens with this hormonal cascade where. You know, I'm just making up numbers here. They begin at maybe 20% body fat. Maybe they live in Toronto. Uh, maybe they go to a great gym called Forders Fitness. And they begin losing weight. What, on a sliding scale, is there a specific range where some of these problems tend to rise? Is it very individual specific? Like what, so from someone who starts leaning out, they're losing a reasonable weight. At what point do we start encountering some of these things where it, it kind of gets ugly? Yeah, I mean, so... Part of it is relative, um, and then part of it is just the absolute. Once you start getting into those essential fat stores, that's where things start to get really interesting. So if you look at the literature investigating metabolic adaptation, uh, typically what they use, any kind of research paradigm, we need some standardization, right? So typically what they use if they're going to study this is they will look at people who have lost 10% of their body weight, okay? And, uh, you know, if you start it, 220 pounds, you lose 22 pounds. It's uh, that's a, a normal kind of sized cut, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's not exactly the most extreme weight loss attempt you'd ever seen. I mean, it's the type of thing when you go see your friends and family that you haven't seen in a couple months, they say, "Omar, you look great." Yeah. But um, but it it's not like the biggest loser is necessary. You don't have to lose like 300 pounds right. to start seeing this stuff. So usually, 10% reduction in body weight is enough, even in people that are um you know, untrained, overweight and obese individuals, even for them, a 10% loss is enough. I would imagine that if you're starting in a pretty athletic body composition, uh, it, it should be, you know, certainly by a 10% weight loss, you know, you, you'd think even maybe a little bit less than that, we'd start to see it. Then there's the absolute body fat. Okay. So, you know, you can lose your 10%, 15% of body mass and that's fine. But when you start getting close to, I mean, you can think of metabolic adaptation as essentially an evolutionary tool uh, that can help 
you know, when we are really short on energy, when there's some kind of famine going on, yeah. it would be really great if we could kind of power down some non-essential energy expenditure and try to conserve it. It's like, like low battery mode on your phone or whatever, right? Yep. So only focusing on the key essential stuff to keep us alive and power down some of the wastes of energy. And so um, you could think of it as an evolutionary tool to help prevent starvation. So when you're like Eric Helms, and you decide that star, you know, semi-starvation is your sport of choice. Right. Uh, you can imagine your body reacts to that in a pretty unfavorable way. And so there's the relative, you know, 10, 15 percent of body mass loss. But then there's once you start approaching absolute minimal viable uh, amounts of fat storage, that's where things get really interesting. So yeah. what I would speculate, like like you said, so somebody starts at 20 percent body fat they're probably experiencing it already once they've lost maybe 10% of their body mass, even if they're not shredded yet. Yeah. But a lot of times you don't hear people really notice it and start talking about it until they're shredded because that's where the effects start to get really, really wild. I mean, they're, you, you can't ignore them at that point. It's yeah. not like, you know what, I think my energy expenditure is about 40 calories lower than it should be. Yeah. You know, you're not going to notice that, but when you're like, you know what, I think my testosterone is like one fifth of what it should be. Yeah. That's when you're going to notice it there. Yeah. You just start crying all of a sudden, wondering why you're doing this in the first, because all, all of these are kind of protective mechanisms. That's what you're saying, uh, uh, Eric. And when I read the article, I found it very interesting where essentially these are signals that your body's trying to send you, you know, via a uh, leptin, uh, ghrelin, where it's like, hey man, eat some food. What are you doing? Find some food. Panic mode. Don't go to sleep. We're going to jack up your quarters. Don't go to sleep. You're starving right now. Your body's not aware that you're trying to get shredded. So it's trying to make it as difficult as possible for you to lose any more weight. Uh, let me ask you then, because online here on the YouTube social media space, um, you have individuals, Eric, they'll say like, you know, how to get a 5% body fat. No problem, right? Is there a range where some of these problems really start arising where not not that it's a opportunity cost here of what you could be doing instead or you know a give or take but would you say that there's a certain range unless you specifically are intending to do this either for a look or a show or something like that where uh, you know a lot of these negative consequences potentially come up what what is uh, that range if we can talk about it because once again we just we hear these numbers being thrown online i'm six percent it's like Okay, I don't think you're 6%. I don't think you'd be feeling that great if you were truly 6% all the time. Yeah, a 6% on the internet is probably 10 or 11%, <laughs> which is a very, I mean, yeah. for a day-to-day -day physique, that's really great. Yeah. Um, so what, what I would say for that range is for males, obviously there, there are some people that are naturally very lean. Yeah. And so they look around, it's like, I remember hearing a story about a, a someone who is like a, a mountain climber and genetically his physiology was just perfectly wired to live at altitude like his oxygen carrying capacity was insane yeah. so he'd go climb mountains with people all of his friends are like you know gasping for air and just like i can't go on he's looking around like what's wrong with all these people yeah. right so I'm, i assume that's how those people feel that are really shredded who are like why are you guys all complaining this stuff's easy yeah uh, but assuming you're not one of those people that is you know very unlikely yeah Usually single digit body fat is where guys start to feel it. So once you're getting below 10% body fat for a lot of guys, some people that number is higher. Um, again, there's some variability there. Some people, when they start getting to 12 or 13, they might start feeling it a little bit. I think for most people, single digits is kind of that, th that, that range where you're like, okay, this is getting pretty rough. And then when it comes to uh, uh, females trying to get very, very lean. So like for males, like I said, five to 10% is usually that range for females. Uh, usually 10 to 15%, like once you start getting into the mid teens and below, yeah. that's where, I mean, I mean, if you've ever seen a, you know, a woman at 10% body fat, it is shredded, yeah. shredded. So, I mean, it, I, I'd say it, it's bumped up a little higher, obviously due to some physiological differences, but for males, five to 10%, for females, anytime you're getting below 15 ish, give or take, yeah. it starts to get really rough. And that's where we start to see, you know, that that's where we really start to see things like testosterone and estrogen tanking. Um, you know, males can usually tell, okay, my testosterone feels low. Females start to have menstrual cycle irregularity, things like that. So I'd say those are the typical ranges, but obviously some people uh, start to feel earlier or later depending on, on their, their genetics really. Yeah. So we're scaring a lot of people away from getting super shredded, but 
let us assume that an individual wants to do this for whatever reason. I've been peer pressured by uh, Eric Helms where he said, in 2020, if I'm going to coach you, you're going to get leaner. So I, I am now asking for my own benefit here, uh, T-Rex, that let's say an individual, what are some of the nutritional strategies to mitigate some of the harmful consequences of metabolic adaptation? So let's, so let's say someone has gotten down to legitimate in the teens, they've been losing some weight, and they they made that decision that, you know what, I'm going to dip down there, not to 5%, like an actual 5%, but let's say a legitimate 8% or 7, 7 to 9% where they're feeling some of these things, it's starting to dip down. As a coach, what are some strategies that you try and implement in order to make it not as terrible as it could be? Yeah, um, I, I wish I had like a quick fix for it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't. But these are kind of dieting best practices. Yeah. Um, that that should, If there's anything that does attenuate this stuff, you should have your bases covered if you follow these best practices. So first of all, we already talked about rate of weight loss. I think a good uh, starting point is half a percent to 1% of body weight per week, trying to maintain that throughout the weight loss process. Um, another key thing is making sure that you have a sensible macronutrient distribution. One of the most important things is high protein. So for most people dieting really hard, trying to get shredded, a lot of times you're going to see that protein ends up getting as high as two to three grams per kilogram. Um, and, and the more shredded you are, you start seeing it get up toward that three grams per kilogram mark. Now that's, that's more than enough if you're bulking, like you don't need to be all the way up at three grams per kilogram. But uh, as you know, the good doctor Eric Helms has published some research showing that as we get leaner, that protein need can actually be increased. Yeah. Um, when it comes to dietary fat, I don't like to go far below 0.6 grams per kilogram per day of fat intake. Uh, in some short term instances, I'll go down to 0.5, but I really don't like going too far below that because we need dietary fat. We need our essential fatty acids. We need to facilitate fat soluble vitamin absorption. Um, and the rest of my calories I'm getting from carbohydrate, whatever I can afford while still staying on that rate of weight loss. Now here's where the, the next two are a little bit more, uh, directly related to metabolic adaptation. So the first is nonlinear methods of weight loss might be helpful. And there's two common ways to do this. So you could do refeeds or you could do diet breaks. And a refeed is typically a short period of time where you're going to increase your caloric intake to get to maintenance or in some studies, you'll see that they, they actually go above maintenance calories. I would say just going to, well, if you're going to do a short term refeed, you have to make it count. So you might go a little bit above maintenance. So if you're going to do a refeed, you'd want it to be based on the evidence I've seen. I think you'd want it to be at least two days in a row. Um, I don't think doing a random day here or there is going to be enough to really do anything in terms of increasing leptin and getting any kind of benefit from that leptin increase. I think probably a more viable strategy, a more uh, advisable strategy, if we're sp specifically focusing on metabolic adaptation, is doing diet breaks. So there's some evidence showing if you do two weeks in a caloric deficit, doing your normal weight loss, and then two weeks at maintenance. So you're not gaining weight during that period. You're just eating enough to stay weight stable for two weeks. You alternate back and forth two weeks on, two weeks off. That seems to attenuate metabolic adaptation, those unexpected or uh, excessive reductions in energy expenditure. Um, I think two and two is kind of a hard sell. So if I'm working with a client and I say, hey, great news, we're going to make your diet twice as long. That That's a hard concept to sell somebody. Yeah. I think, uh, and I use sell in the uh, metaphorical sense there, it's hard to convince somebody to buy into that <laughs> and, and be enthusiastic about it. So I, I think a more sensible approach is one to three ratio. So one week uh, at maintenance, three weeks of dieting, one week at maintenance, going back and forth. I, I would speculate that that's enough to get the job done. What we're trying to do in that maintenance level is just convince your body basically, hey, what are you worried about? No. We got plenty of energy. Like yeah. you're, not, you're not hurting for energy. And in that time frame, hopefully we do have some restoration of leptin and increase in activity level. Some of those hormones we talked about, ideally getting a little bit of a boost back into their normal range before we initiate the, the caloric deficit again. Now my other one, that is, this is kind of like my thing that I always shout about without a ton of research behind it. I just think people go way too overboard with cardio when they're dieting. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, because they've cardioed themselves to death, 
they think that they feel horrible because of metabolic adaptation and they really feel feel horrible because they're doing enough weight training to probably be like borderline overtrained and they're also doing enough cardio to be borderline overtrained in isolation and they're doing both at once yeah they're, they're basically like you know a full-time weightlifter who also trains for a marathon on the side yeah. uh the overall training volume is just insane uh, their cortisol to testosterone ratio is is completely out of whack. I think a lot of things that people associate with the the fatigue, the lethargic feelings, the hunger, the sleep disruption, uh, the poor recovery, I really think a lot of people are just way overdoing their cardio. Um, so those are my two things that that I really preach. And then the final one is a little bit unexpected, but focusing on sleep hygiene. You mentioned previously, we didn't really go into it, but a really common observation is a lot of people that are prepping for bodybuilding shows can't sleep. Um, I think if I were to speculate, I think it's kind of similar to what we see with rodents. If you do like a semi-starvation study in rodents and you restrict their food intake, they actually get more active. They start kind of scavenging around their little cage and getting really active because they're like, we're screwed. We got to go find some food immediately. Yeah. And w we don't start scurrying around our apartment necessarily, but it is very hard to get a decent amount of quality sleep while dieting. And I wouldn't be shocked if those two things are kind of evolutionarily linked in an evolutionary sense. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to get restful sleep. Uh, and the only thing you can really do about it is focus in on key aspects of sleep hygiene to try to promote good quality restful sleep uh, as much as possible. But I'm sure Eric, I'm sure the other Eric Helms yeah. has talked to you about it, but Last time I prepped, uh, the, the prep went very well. I did no structured cardio, which was a totally different experience for, I mean, it was incredible, way better. But the one thing that really got me last time was it, it would be so hard to get four and a half hours of sleep. Uh, and that's from someone who typically sleeps, sleeps about seven hours a night. Uh, very, very difficult despite my absolute best attempts to, to maximize and optimize my sleep hygiene. So what we do know is that when people have very poor, very restricted sleep during weight loss attempts, their body composition results are a little bit less favorable. Um, we also know there's countless performance studies showing that poor sleep does have a direct impact on your performance in the gym. So I, I think sleep hygiene is kind of the, the other thing that you can hopefully do uh, to, to maximize your odds of a successful uh, weight loss attempt. Yeah, there's this little known guy called uh, Greg Knuckles, who had a fantastic article about sleep and essentially putting forth which I like the way that it's framed, the sleep is more powerful than any legal supplement you could take to favorably favorably change your body composition. Um, to be serious now for a second, I do have to give immense respect to Eric Helms, who has been fantastic were uh, what you uh, hinted at right there. Eric, the diet break this time around when I did it, and I did lose about 20 pounds. I went from 198 to like 179, um, and I did a 3-2, 3-2, just easy as can be, and it was a marked difference this time. You know, all those, the hunger signals, I'm fine. I'm fine, you know, going to bed hungry is no problem. Something that I do care about as a, you know, quote-unquote recreational strength athlete, the performance in the gym I would tend to notice when I go back to maintenance that everything feels a lot better. I don't feel that it's like bone on bone as I'm lifting or that you just feel hollow and empty. Um, I think a whole other episode with you would be fascinating to talk about cardio because it's sort of one of those things where it's okay, like I want to optimize my weight, uh, my weight loss. I have to do more, right? So I'm already training. I need to then do more. And there's that emotional response rather than sort of some of the things that you're saying. It's like, well, are you getting enough sleep? It's like, well, how's everything else that you're doing right now? And so we we tend to think Ingve Malmsteen style that more is more always. Um, and uh, let me ask you then for a little bit of clarity for those that do endeavor, once again, to get a little leaner when we talk about the rate of weight loss and you say, let, let's just say uh, half, a, half a percent to 1% per week. Does that change as you get leaner? So let's say once again, we're 20% body fat. We're kind of loving life. It's easy. We're losing a percent. Should that change as we get leaner or would that rate of weight loss essentially, should we shoot for something that's similar across the board? Just out of curiosity. Well, I mean, it will naturally change a little bit because it's percentage based. So it's, you know, 1% of a heavier starting weight versus 1% of a, you know, close to the end of the diet. Uh, but you could if you wanted to. I mean, realistically, we don't lose our weight in a linear manner, especially if we're trying to get for a bodybuilder, as lean as you could possibly get, you start to see um, 
is your audience comfortable with math terms? An Absolutely. asymptotic uh, yeah. kind of trend where you kind of approach that. I, I was just joking, but y y where you're just approaching that, like, that it's it at a certain point. Like, this is the leanest I'll possibly get. And though it starts to get so diminished your week over week weight loss. Yeah. Uh, so realistically, when you're starting to try to push toward getting really, really, really shredded, yeah, you're, it's going to get slower over time. It'll, it might start at 1% per week and then drift toward 0.5% per week. And then, you know, if you're talking about a bodybuilder who's almost stage ready, but trying to put the finishing touches on changes in weight at that point in the diet are going to be pretty negligible. So it depends on exactly how close you are to your absolute lower limit of body fat, um, in, in terms of how diminished those, those week to week changes get. But it, it's a good point that the, the, 0.5 to 1% is if you're going from, if, you're, if your end point is a realistic, uh, maintainable body fat level, you, you probably can just keep it as a percentage basis and it'll shrink a little bit over time. But, but again, that kind of asymptotic effect when you start approaching your absolute leanest, um, th that, that is where it gets, uh, it, you, you start to have really small changes week to week. It gets sad. And I, I should just clarify that, yes, we are, uh, I appreciate you asking us permission to use math terms because, well, we are creationists around here, which is the only realistic uh, viewpoint one can have. We are Correct. math adjacent allies due to obviously uh, numerology, which uh, we're huge upon. And that that is based on numbers. Once again, the Trinity, 12 disciples. So we, we are yeah. math adjacent allies, but we are staunch creationists around here. So I appreciate you Beautiful. asking. Yeah. Yeah. It, the, the irony is I'm actually horrible at math. So the idea that I'd make some snarky comment, like right. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. But if you don't know me, I probably sounded like the biggest asshole. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suck at math. I never even took calculus, which yeah. is I don't know how I I don't know how I pulled that off, to be honest. But, uh, but asymptotic never, is. But you, you've had to obviously with your degrees and so forth. I've never taken a calculus course. But you know about integrals and derivations and everything. I understand that they exist. <laughs> you got to be messing with me. No, I'm, so I mean, I, I use things that are related to <laughs> calculus. So yeah. Like I've taken physics class that are, yeah. you know, they use some of the concepts, but yes. <laughs> I have never, no one has ever placed a calculus problem on my right. desk and said, Eric, get to work. Yeah. yeah. Never happened. I was, uh, so t uh, speaking about G just being a uh, lethargic, torpid individual such as myself, um, I, I essentially, I used to do a lot of athletics. I know you're a wrestler uh, back in the day. And then I got into just some academic programs. And that was just my excuse not to do anything whatsoever. So I'd just be chilling there at all times. And then the one time after years and years of just, you know, doing that bullshit, uh, a buddy of mine challenged me to a race. And then I did the race. And because I had done no physical activity for three years, I had it must have been a sugar attack or something where I sprinted 150 meters and no, no joking because we're, we're kids. You don't know any better. I was like 16 or 17. I was rocked for an hour and a half where I felt like a zombie. It was fantastic. It's like this kid knows about integrals at 16, but he can't run to catch a bus. It's sick. Yeah. I, I've never heard the term sugar attack that yeah. I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, to be very clear, that, that joke about using a, a fancy math term was purely at my expense because I'm, I'm still ashamed that I somehow, <laughs> somehow they, the American education system, imagine. It didn't fail you. I, I got a, a PhD in a hard science that involved a ton <laughs> of physics work and they just never bothered to be like, hey, you should learn calculus. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. You know, what's funny is uh, Eric Helms didn't even know that about me. Some of the stuff where I, I just uh, said some uh, calculus term. And he just uh, turned to me and he said, you don't know calculus. I said, Eric, if you want to do this right now, we absolutely can. Uh, and he just like, he looked at me and he was like, then he paused for a second. He's like, all right, this isn't, this, this isn't a tree I want to bark up. It's just real funny. Yeah. So, so people that know me in the field, like, uh, stats are kind of my thing. Yeah. That's Nitty gritty statistics, yeah. but you never actually have to do it by hand. Yeah. So like I, I can still use the stats concepts, but. Um, I remember Greg, Greg Knuckles, when we first started kind of working together, um, you know, Greg is like a human yeah. supercomputer, it's especially silent. with mathematics. It's yeah. crazy. Um, but, but he, he knew that about me was that I was really into statistics and a, a pretty, pretty deeply into statistics. And when I told him I, I had never actually learned calculus, he didn't believe me. And then he really, our relationship's never been the same. Yeah. 
he was really upset and and he doesn't respect me anymore his yeah his, his uh response was tepid to say the least we i do remember no uh uh Greg's a whiz, and I got to give him absolute respect. And I can say this now. We had spoken, him and myself, years and years ago about some machine learning stuff where I have a buddy of mine who has a few degrees in math, and we're talking about some PDE, some partial differential equations, uh, essentially to make a really cool app about training, but then obviously the cost we ran into and all this stuff. No, he he's all about it, uh, T-Rex. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, he's all about it. Um, I, I'm convinced he's sent from the future to prevent World War III. I don't know, but uh, we'll see what happens. Or to start it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't we don't know his intentions. That's the thing. He's he's so smart that he can pretend to be benevolent, and meanwhile, he's bringing about our destruction. Yep. Yeah. Now, uh, to get back on topic, I do want to ask the question that uh, individuals. So let's say there are some natural consequences of getting lean. Cool. Okay. Um, what are some of the lasting effects once an individual gets lean? So let's say we've gone through this process and you actually have leaned down. So whatever, we say that 20% and they get somewhere, you know, 10%, 9%, they're feeling some of the effects. How do we return someone to feeling normal? Like what, what is this process now to uh, restore? Because we understand some individuals are emotionally damaged. Some might be metabolically damaged. Uh, what what do you do to restore someone to feeling normal and functioning normally after you know this process so someone's gotten lean t-rex where do we go from there it's a good question it, it, it ultimately is goal dependent but uh should we should we assume that they want to stay at this low body fat essentially as long as they can yeah let's go with that one first yeah so with that uh what we want to do is get you as close to normal as possible obviously normal would be to have not changed. So if we wanted to get you purely back to normal, we'd just go back to your initial body weight and, and hang out there again. But what we can do is, I talked about some of these consequences are related to the loss of fat mass, some are related to being in an acute energy deficit. So the first obvious thing you can do is remove the energy deficit. And that will go a pretty long way uh, in terms of making you feel a little bit more like yourself. You'll have a higher caloric intake that you can take in every day which gives you some flexibility from the diet perspective and hopefully can get you away from being so fixated on the food, um, having a little more wiggle room in the diet. Now, there's also the idea that, again, assuming you want to stay there, you might be able to actually continue increasing your calories a little bit from there, this concept of reverse dieting. Now, you're not going to create some kind of supercharged metabolic rate. That's not what happens. But what we do see is in many cases, you have your initial increase in calories, you're back to maintenance. If you slowly increase your calories from there, uh, there might be a chance that what can happen is as you increase the calories, you do have a slight adaptive increase to kind of match that. We talked about how some people are really resistant to overfeeding. Um, there is a possibility that you can get away with giving yourself a little more room in the diet by making a few incremental increases in calories and hoping that you do have some kind of uh, in like as you're increasing the calories, you are also increasing your non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, activation of the sympathetic nervous system and things of that nature to have some of these compensatory subconscious increases uh, in um, in energy expenditure to offset those calories. So there's no magic going on there, um, unfortunately, but pretty much that's the best we can do is, is hope that we get back to, to energy balance and then increase things from there. When it comes to successful weight maintenance, a couple of the key things, I, I will say one of the things I found was I did a study on physique athletes and we found that the people who increased their pro had the highest protein intakes after the competition did seem to have a nice little recovery in their uh, resting metabolic rate. Um, and at first I said, eh, it's a small sample. It's a correlation. I'm not going to look too far into it. There was a paper published last month that found that uh, the adaptive therm thermogenesis that they saw in weight maintenance was uh, less pronounced in a group on a high protein diet than a, a like a low or moderate protein diet. So there might be something there. But the reason I'm not super excited about those results is you already knew you should have been on a high protein diet anyway. So I, I don't know if there's anything we can do with that aside from the general recommendation when you're in weight maintenance, you should obviously still be on a pretty high protein diet compared to the typical protein diet. Um, and another thing is maintaining activity level. Uh, what they find time and time again with uh, people who are really successful with weight maintenance after losing weight is they keep their physical activity level, whether it's exercise or non-exercise, preferably both, keeping those activity levels high and continuing to monitor things. 
So monitoring your body weight, monitoring your caloric intake, those are the habits that seem to be associated with really successful weight maintenance. So you might still be in a, in a position where, yeah, maybe your hormones aren't all the way back to where they were before you started losing weight, but at least you're maintaining this body weight. You feel pretty good. You, you've, you know, psychologically, you're kind of back more toward normal. Physiologically, you feel fine. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a partial recovery that, that we had hoped to, to obtain there. Fantastic. And maybe the last thing I want to talk about are some of the psychological effects where to be once again, serious for a second, because there's uh, <laughs> your body, your body's kind of panicking. And so your hormones uh, get out of whack. There's that hormonal cascade that occurs. But there's in the fitness industry, you'll hear like no pain, no gain, you got to grind it out. Like this is what you do. Um, for individuals that are feeling the natural consequence of just getting leaner. Um, can you just talk, not the psychology of it, but just the fact that these are inevitable consequences of getting lean and that they're okay to feel, you know, all these the intense cravings where I think um, the way that Eric Helms phrased it, which was really cool on a podcast, is that it's it's not even your mind telling you these things. It's your body at a certain point where there's such a huge, it's not even, a, it's almost not even a question of willpower at a certain point where it's not like, oh, am I tough enough to resist the cravings? It's like, no, your, your body is in a full-fledged panic mode. And I think for individuals, and that's why I ask you this both as a researcher, Eric, and also as a practitioner, someone who has gotten that lean, where a lot of individuals that, you know, once again, myself, maybe the leanest I've gotten on 11%, 10%. It's like once you start really chipping down, some of uh, some of these things will happen. And until you get there, you don't even realize it. Can you maybe just uh, give a subjective commentary then on some of those things or not even what to expect, but just uh, for individuals that are concerned that they feel that the house is burning down, that eventually it's going to be okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The, the first time I did a contest prep, I didn't get that lean. Yeah. And I was like, ah, this isn't so bad. Um <laughs> The second time I did a contest prep, I did get very lean and I had no idea to expect all that. And it hits you like a ton of bricks. The, the fixation with food, the urges to binge eat, um, it, it's weird and you don't expect it. Another thing is uh, when you have a huge drop in testosterone and your testosterone to estrogen ratio gets a little bit out of whack, I remember having uh, some emotional swings that I wouldn't typically have. Right. And that's not to, to make a, a joke or anything, but I remember going, wow. And actually, true story, I called my mother immediately and I was like, is this what having a lot of estrogen is like? And she was like, yeah, it's uh, it's not that great, is it? <laughs> and I was like, no. Um, I mean, it's so it's it, it's real stuff. Um, and so, the like I said, the first time I got really lean, I experienced all those things. And I was like, this is horrible. And it was psychologically hard to deal with because I didn't know it was normal and I didn't know that there was an end to it. I was like, <laughs> I guess this is just how I live now. It's not how I like to live. For the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah, this is me. So w what happened was the most recent time I prepped, you, you develop such a better relationship with those things where you feel it coming on and you go, oh, you again. Yeah. You're not worried about it. It's, it's nothing to panic about. You, it, it's almost an interesting thing where yeah. you're just like, ah. Looks like that's happening now, but it, but it's not as stressful. You know that okay, once once I'm past this competition and I'm kind of back to normal habits, it's going to be uh, a non-factor. So it is very uh, very normal. It's not fun when it happens, but it, it's nothing. Uh, you shouldn't feel weird for being like I feel like I'm kind of panicking because my physiology is completely out of whack. Um, yeah, it's it's to be expected, and uh, the good news is that there, there's there's an end to it yeah. eventually. Oh, why, hello there, no libido, uh, my old friend. I haven't seen you in some time. <laughs> yeah, that's that is a thing that absolutely happens. Yeah, which is which is again, it's you can't ignore it at a certain point. You're just like, so I, I guess I'll never have a libido again. And yeah. luckily, that, that's not the case. Well, I think uh, I just think of all the kids listening to this, how much more productive they'd be if they got that lean. Where if they if they became truly team no fapstronauts, they probably could accomplish so much with their life. So really, it's a good thing. Focus on your studies. <laughs> That's what that that is the through thread of this entire conversation. I think uh, T Rex, you've absolutely nailed this. To now wrap it up and come full circle, is there anything that we spoke about that you kind of want to clarify? Anything they feel we uh, sort of shortchanged? Um, no, I guess my my overarching point. We talked about a lot of these. Um, you know what happens, what we can do about it. Uh, some of the stuff we we just have to accept as part of human physiology. 
The thing I really want to stress is that there is there is no such thing as a metabolic adaptation dead end. And what I mean by that is a lot of people think they get to a spot where they're like, well, this is it. I've metabolically adapted and weight loss for me is no longer possible. It's off the table. That's never the case. We can always go further. But what happens is as the adaptation gets greater and as we get leaner, we have to start making some decisions that aren't always advisable. You know, you, you might get to a point where you're like, I have to lower my caloric intake beyond where I'm at now to continue getting leaner. And I don't know if that's a good idea for my health. Yeah. And sometimes that that's a real thing that happens and you have to make that decision for yourself. And so the, the one thing I, I just really resent uh, is when you start hearing people say, one of the reasons that I'm not losing fat is because I'm eating too too little. And so I'm in starvation mode and my body's fighting back and causing me to gain weight. That, that's not a thing that's ever been documented in a mammal or any other uh, any other living organism that I'm aware of. So this idea that you're you're so metabolically adapted that fat loss is permanently just stalled and there's nothing you can do about it or the idea that you're eating so little that it's causing you to gain weight, those are not scientifically justifiable ideas. That's interesting because I personally identify myself as a cephalopod. And so that when you said mammal, I appreciate the distinction that you made there. Just just because we haven't investigated everyone yet. We just don't know, right? What's a cephalopod? Uh, honestly, I'm blanking right now. I was trying to come up with oh, the, man. the proper terminology for a surf claim because one of the nicknames of myself on the channel is a uh, surf claim. I, I'm going to go, honestly, I'm going to go with uh, squids. Uh, like squids and uh, octopus. I could be totally wrong. Greg once told me an interesting theory about oh. octopi and why they're not the smartest beings on the planet, like and, an evolutionary reason. And what is that? He said it's something to do like if, if octopi actually raised their young the way we do, that evolutionarily they would have totally beat us to the intelligence. But because they just, I guess octopi have their babies and they're like, all right, good luck. And they don't like teach them and raise them. I, I guess that was a critical step. I'm paraphrasing yeah. that. That's probably yeah. completely false. <laughs> no, I, I Don't write that in your, in your homework uh, assignment. <laughs> yeah. That, Hey, the truth read study is what we learned. <laughs> um, I think we have covered so much in this interview. I think you've eloquently explained a lot that maybe for individuals, because you feel a certain way, you know, I, I receive a lot one of the most common ones when it comes to weight loss is, hey, man, I want to lose weight. I think I should be eating these calories. I'm not losing the weight I should. What's going on? And again, there's an emotional attachment to how we look. So sometimes understanding the science behind it to enable us to know that, hey, it's going to be all right. These are some of the things that occur here. Here are some of the strategies that we can implement. I think it's just fantastic. So, uh, Eric, I want to thank you for being on. I want to open the floor now to you. People should be following you. For those that don't know, go ahead. Check out his Instagram. He also does coaching. Uh, he, his content game on Instagram is just uh, truly revolutionary is what I would say. I, I've, I've actually told you numerous times in the DM just to keep doing what you're doing, man. Yeah, my, my Instagram, it's at Trexler Fitness. I'm pushing the limits of what one can do with Instagram. Right. Uh, it's innovative content. And uh, yeah, reach out to me on there. And you can always find me on strongerbyscience.com as well. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to improve your uh, pimping yourself game. Everyone should check out Eric Trexler. I think you put out just fantastic uh, content. I think the intellectual honesty and rigor that you hold for yourself and the standards of the content you put out Excellent, man. And I think you speak in such a way that a lot of people can understand and they can have a lot of takeaways. So I just want to say a big thank you for being on the channel. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Eat your vegetables. Eat your vegetables. Eat your fucking vegetables.